I'm just really building up here for the entrance. Okay. Good Friday morning, backyard naturalist friends. It's September 16th. My name is Tim. I work for the Urban Ecology Center here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm coming to you from my home office near Washington Park, and uh, I'm excited to tell you some stories this morning about, uh, I don't think I would call it one of my favorite plants, uh, but I also don't know why I just said that. The stinging nettle is a really cool plant uh, and has some great stories. So I'm excited to tell some stories this morning about one of my favorite local plants, the stinging nettle. It's a, it's a plant with a not so good reputation, but uh, if you get to know it a little bit, hopefully that changes. And for some, it's a plant with a great reputation and hopefully that doesn't change after this. Um, it's a very nutritious and delicious plant. People all over the world eat it, uh, it, it as an herb, they eat it as a green, as a spice uh, for, for medicinal value and the stinging nettle also urticates. It causes urtication. So what's urtication? We'll find out in episode three of season four of the Backyard Naturalist Sound of Nettle. But first, a heartfelt and humble thank you to those of you who support this program by joining as a subscriber. To sweeten the deal a bit, we're starting a series of mostly monthly in-person uh, outings around the backyards of the greater Milwaukee area. And for those of you outside the greater Milwaukee area, we'll think of, of something else cool. But for those of you in and around Brew City, our first field trip is tomorrow, Saturday, September 17th at 10 a.m. We'll meet in front of the Urban Ecology Center at Riverside Park for a short hike through space and time uh, as former backyard naturalist guest host, Dr. Bill Keen, who is uh, emeritus geology professor through the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's geology department. He will take us on a journey along the Urban Ecology Center's three billion year walk. So a few years back, a generous gift from the Frankie family allowed us to create a kind of art and education installation uh, along a pathway. So it's a series of rock sculptures or cairns, uh, some as high as seven feet tall, and it's along a path from the Riverside Park building down to the canoe launch along the Milwaukee River. Uh, Nick Tompkins, who's the stonemason who also built the that arch to the Arboretum, put this installation in as well. And the goal was to, to kind of a, do a unique way of, of telling Wisconsin's own unique geological history as a, as a journey along a walking path. So he basically hunted all over Wisconsin for rocks that represent different ages, uh, different geologic periods, and, and, and ones that tell different stories. So tomorrow we will start from the youngest rock, which is the closest one to the building. And then as you walk, the, the rocks get, get progressively older. The youngest one is a 390 million year old Devonian dolomite uh, that represents represents a time when fish were the dominant life form and and forests on land were not dominated by trees because trees weren't around uh, so the forests on land were, were dominated by these large bryophytes these club mosses uh, and even giant fungi like forests of fungi so we'll move from rock to rock uh, each one represents an older period uh, with, with Dr. Keen, and um, he'll kind of tell us the stories that weave together the physical entities in front of us with our with Wisconsin's geological history. And so then we end with a three billion year old Precambrian jade uh, down by the river. So join us if you can. The hike is open to anyone, but it's absolutely free uh, only for the Backyard Naturalist subscribers as a show of thanks for your support. So uh, if you'd like more information, you. you you want to join on this? Join us on this fun and educational walk. Uh, you can contact me after today's episode. And because our backyards offer a direct relationship with the skies, the heavens, the space, uh, through astronomy, through stargazing, um, or just sitting in your backyard and looking up, there's an, a nice connection between our backyards and the heavens. Uh, so I've just got a few updates on the astronomy side of things, starting with the Artemis One project. Uh, this is a joint venture between NASA and the European Space Agency that is hoping to get people back on the moon, boots on the ground, 
And uh, we've been following this for a while now in some of these episodes with anticipation. Um, we've had several updates. And unfortunately, uh, I think the last time I talked about this, the launch was set for the next day, like September 3rd or 4th. And unfortunately, the launch date was delayed again. So Sean the Sheep and the three humanoid mannequins are going to have to wait a little bit longer. Um, they're part of the first phase of orbiting the moon. And that's kind of a necessary step before sending real humans. Um, and so the launch date has been postponed a couple times for technical issues, but, and it's now slated for September 27th. So keep our fingers crossed. Um, the, the, there's a new issue that happened. The, there were some leaky seals in the, in, in the hydrogen uh, lines. And um, so they have to run some tests. And then they're hoping not to have to move the whole rocket back to the assembly building to retest the flight termination system, which I mentioned earlier is kind of what protects us here on Earth if the rocket goes astray. Um, so in the last update, they initially thought that one of the rockets wasn't being cooled to low enough temperature. Um, but it turned out that it was, it was actually fine and it was a faulty sensor. And then, but then a, a new hydrogen leak appeared along a fuel line. So we'll keep you posted. We'll, we'll hopefully get that, that mission will get, get off the ground. Um, but, but they definitely won't launch Artemis on September 26th because that's when a, a, all of NASA's eyes and equipment will be focused on a different mission, the DART mission. And DART stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. And uh, it's not because they're worried that this asteroid is going to hit the Earth, like, like in, in the movie uh, Don't Look Up. Um, but such an event could occur. And if it did, it could be catastrophic. So NASA's uh, going to rendezvous with a small asteroid named Dimorphos. And by rendezvous, I mean they're going to slam a 1,200-pound spacecraft traveling 15,000 miles an hour into the asteroid to see if deflecting at asteroids is even a possibility in the future. It's a pretty small asteroid. If it were a larger asteroid, you'd probably need more. Um, but we're going to see. It's kind of that first test uh, in, in our kind of new future here. So That'll be another fun astronomical event to keep track of to see if that works. And then a few days later, NASA's uh, Juno mission, which has already been very, very successful in telling us a lot about the planet Jupiter, uh, is gonna do a really close flyby of Jupiter's moon Europa. And that's important because it's one of the most promising places in our solar system to search for extraterrestrial life. Uh, so, so promising that that there's two future spacecraft that are slated to only visit Europa as their primary destination. And then finally, our regular fall, the autumnal equinox is just around the corner. This marks the beginning of astronomical fall. And during the equinox, every location on planet Earth experiences 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night. We're all equal. And many cultures through time have marked this occasion. And if you'd like to celebrate, the equinox this year. It falls on Thursday, September 22nd at 8.03 p.m. That's next Thursday. And Maggie and Amanda and I will be in a staff retreat at that time. So hopefully we'll be celebrating that as well. Okay, on to the featured organism. Uh, this is a plant, a plant that we all learned last week contains these dynamic chloroplasts, that kind of these dynamic mind-blowing chloroplasts. Uh, a plant that, like all plants, has been evolving in its own way over millions of years. And as a speaker uh, mentioned last week, uh, plants can't run around, so they have to evolve in their spot that they are. And um, so that leads to some, some fantastic adaptations that we're really just beginning to discover. Uh, the plant we're focusing on today is called the stinging nettle. And there are several nettles around the world that sting you. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna focus on this one and just a couple more. And since since my favorite part of the Backyard Natural series is hearing about the personal relationships we all have with these critters, with the plants and animals, um, I, I love hearing about how you have inter interacted with the yellow jackets or or the stories of your oak tree growing up or or seeing a coyote or or hearing a loon. Those are the most important stories to me. Those are the most fun stories to hear about because we each have different relationships um, with nature and with the critters. And, um, you know, these, these personal stories are the ones that, that have the biggest influence on our personal relationships. So 
I will begin with a very impactful relationship that I had uh, with a particular type of nettle. This is almost 30 years ago now. This is in Australia. And the plant is locally called the gimpy gimpy or the stinging tree. And my first encounter with this innocuous looking plant was on a hike. And, and uh, we had a, a, a trip leader, a trip naturalist, and he, he came across one of these. He pointed, pointed one of them out to us. Uh, I thought he was being dramatic, but he was, he said, hey, look at this plant, study this plant, recognize this plant, because you don't ever want to touch this plant. Um, you know, he mentioned some of the properties, how that if you touch it, it can bring you excruciating pain. Uh, the chemicals are similar to, to the venom you get from snakes and spiders, uh, and the pain level is, is often similar, um, that people have died from their reactions to this plant. So, of course, my initial 20-year-old dumb brain reaction to this was, I really want to touch this tree. I want to know, I mean, how bad can it be? I really want to know how bad the pain is. I was on the verge of touching it, and just to find out. But I, my, I don't know, my survival instincts went out. They got the best of me. There were other people around, so I just left the plant alone. Um, and, and if you know Australia, if there's, if there's one thing you probably know about Australia is that there are a lot of really dangerous things there. Um, things that kill you in obvious and dramatic ways like crocodiles and snakes. Uh, there are things that kill you in more subtle but equally lethal ways like the blue ringed octopus or the box jellyfish. Um, there are things that are really downright sneaky in their killing of you, like reef crabs. Uh, you get just a, a tiny bit of a reef crab in a, in a seafood soup and you're gone. Um, sometimes restaurants have killed multiple people. Um, the cone shell, it doesn't look that crazy, but um, they're deadly. Somebody, while I was there, put one in their pocket and it stung, stung them through their pocket and um, they died. And there's even a bird, the cassowary, that can kill you in Australia. And, and just recently on the news, there was somebody that died from a kangaroo attack. So everything's deadly there. Um, and then a few days later, I come across a sign very similar to this one that, that made me think twice, like, oh, maybe I'm glad I didn't touch that tree when, when he told us about it, that you know, he, he, maybe he wasn't exaggerating so much. Um, and uh, maybe I should keep my distance from the stinging tree. So. I kind of felt duly warned about the stinging tree, but then we we also got a, a slightly less severe warning about a, a different plant called the wait a while, um, which honestly to me looks much scarier than the stinging tree. It's called the wait a while because if you run into it, you have to wait a while while you extract yourself from the massive amounts of, of super sharp thorns. And so to, to my misfortune during a research survey, I saw a wait a while directly ahead of me in my transect. So we're supposed to walk uh, you know, along a compass bearing as best as possible. And I thought, I'm not gonna take my compass bearing through this, this wait a while. Um, so I just thought I'd deviate a little bit to the right. And so I'm kind of still awestruck and focused on the scariness of this wait a while. And I start to walk around it. And then I get this searing pain in my leg. And I look down and I see that the culprit was a stinging tree that we had been warned about. And so in my shock at the pain and my surprise at how painful it actually was, I kind of jumped away from it and had the good fortune to land in a whole patch of stinging tree plants uh, in my shorts. So I'm getting stung all over my legs. Um, and then, so now my mind is racing. It's, it's, it's racing from a level of pain I had never experienced in my life, not even close. Uh, it's racing because all I can hear in my head are the words of, of that guide that told us a few days earlier that, oh, people sometimes die from their stinging trees. So I hurried back as best as I could to the research station with a compass bearing. Uh, and, and, the, and I saw my advisor there and uh, he saw the distress in my face and looked at me and asked what had happened. And I, I told him, and then his look of concern kind of died down a little bit uh, and, and became more of a smirk because he said, well, you're not dead yet, so you probably won't die. Um, and you know, it's it's primarily more of a of like a, a reaction, um, a, an allergic reaction that some people it hits harder than others. So at that point, um, there really wasn't much here I I or we anybody could do. The 
the stinging tree injects thousands of these urticating silicate hairs that are full of venom. And, the, and again, the venom is similar to in structure to some of the spiders and snakes. And so uh, while stopping the pain wasn't really an option, the next best thing we could do was to try to start getting some of those hairs out of my legs. Um, and so he began, my, my advisor began the, the delicate process by literally picking up a roll of duct tape and then started taping my legs and very unceremoniously ripping off the tape like a Band-Aid to try to get uh, some of those hairs out of the leg. And then he sent someone to the pharmacy for some leg waxing materials. Uh, and then I experienced the, the wonders of my first leg waxing treatment for the first time. Um, and then the only other thing I could really do was, was, was you know, take extra strength Tylenol. Uh, they, they did take me to the medical clinic, but, but there was really nothing they could do. That, that left me more dejected when they said there wasn't much they could help with. So uh, this innocuous looking plant caused me the biggest physical pain of my life. The first night I didn't sleep uh, because even, even drifting off to sleep didn't happen because the pain would wake me up again. And I was up pretty much all night with the pain. It was just unrelentless. Uh, but then eventually, uh, over a period of several days, the, the pain started to, to subside a bit. And I remember entering the stage where the, the reactions were still painful, but then it was kind of switching to this super itchy stage. And so I'd scratch the area and it had this intense mix of both pleasure and pain. Um, that I'd really rather not experience again. And, and the stinging tree has some extra cool tricks up its sleeves for mammals, because um, the, the hairs are stay in your leg for, for quite a while, and they don't release the toxin all at once. They release most of it right away, but there's still a lot in the hairs. And so, you know, most of it gets released the first day, first few days, um, but it takes about six months for them to dissolve. And, and then if they get jostled, or more importantly, if, if your skin gets cold and, and contracts, the, the pores contract around the hairs again, there, it releases more toxins. So about a week later, I went swimming for the first time and got this huge shock of pain getting in the water because the, the cold water uh, on my skin. Um, and then even two months later, I, I was in, in college in Minneapolis. So stepping off the plane in Minneapolis and or stepping out of the airport into the 20 below weather, that, that frigid Minnesota sent another kind of shock of pain. Um, so needless to say, my experience with this nettle, the stinging tree was, was quite memorable. I survived, I can talk about it. And uh, to set the stage, I can say that thankfully, none of the nettles that we have here in Wisconsin uh, come remotely close to the pain of this Australian species. We do have plants here that are dangerous. Um, I've never experienced personally the pain of the wild parsnip, but I know people who have, and, and I hear it's really bad. It can cause second degree burns uh, and huge blisters. But we're talking about nettles today. And thankfully the, the nettles in this part of the world by comparison are, are pretty harmless. So if we start with the most common nettle, the common nettle known to most of us as a stinging nettle, that's everywhere. Uh, we, we, we find it, um, in just about any green space, um, most of our parks, uh, a lot of us in our yards, either on purpose or an accident, um, people like to, to harvest it. Um, and the nettles belong to the family urticaceae. And so I mentioned um, at the beginning that, that nettles are urticating. And, and the first time I heard that word, I had no clue what it meant, but it's a great word. Uh, the defi definition of urticating is causing a stinging or prickling sensation. And here you see examples of, of the most common urticators in nature. So uh, plants like the nettles are, are maybe one of the more common urticants, but uh, there are also many caterpillars that have urticating hairs, which is why as a general rule, uh, I don't touch caterpillars uh, unless, um, or particularly I don't touch the, the, the hairy ones. Um, and, and some, some caterpillars around the world are really bad. And even in Wisconsin, we've got some, some particularly nasty ones to touch. So uh, also some tarantulas have urticating hairs, which is separate from their bite. Um, and, and it's a defense mechanism. So, so it, it, they will embed their hairs in an attacker. Um, and, 
so that causes distress for the whatever is attacking them. And then the tarantula will often actually lose uh, quite a few hairs uh, around a spot. And um, so sometimes you'll see tarantulas with little bald spots um, from when they had an encounter and then the, the hairs will grow back. But those hairs are also can be pretty urticating and, and pretty, pretty bad, especially if you react to them, if you have an allergic reaction. So the family urticacea uh, includes, it's mostly nettles. Um, it also, if you've ever been to the tropics and seen the Cecropia tree, uh, that's also in this family. It's one of the favorite hangouts for sloths. Um, Cecropia trees don't sting, but, but they often uh, house ants. They often cohabit with ants that live in their hollow stems and protect the tree. So if you put your hand on a tree, you might get a visit from some nasty stinging ants. Um, there's over 2,600 species in the family, uh, 50 genera, and apart from the polar regions, they are found worldwide. They can be found as shrubs, as lianas, uh, as forbs and sometimes even as trees. Um, and But most of the members of this wind pollinated family have these urticating hairs for which they're named, urticaceae. Our stinging nettle is in the genus Urtica. Um, and in general, this group propagates by rhizomes as a clone, but then they also reproduce sexually. Uh, opposite leaf branching patterns, squared stems, and you can usually see those urticating hairs pretty well. They advertise themselves pretty well. It's, it's found in the above ground growth. Um, as a group, this plant has been really, really important uh, as a food source for humans uh, for a long time and um, for use in soups and teas and juices and uh, as a spice, uh, ales. Uh, and, and in addition to the food and medicinal value of this plant, to humans, um, it's it's uh, also they produce a woven fiber for for clothing and and fishing nets and even paper um, sailcloth. So it's not surprising that because of the urticating hairs, this group of plants tends to be avoided by mammals who are more sensitive, um, more susceptible to the irritation. But it's a very important plant, a very important native plant. Uh, for a lot of other wildlife, particularly insects and particularly uh, caterpillars. So as a group, things like the red admiral butterfly, the tortrix moth um, depend on nettles. But if you were to walk through many of the green spaces in Milwaukee County, uh, you most often come across the species of nettle that we call the stinging nettle or the common nettle. So it's not native to Wisconsin or, or, or anywhere in North America. Uh, it was originally found in temperate areas of, of Europe and Asia. Um, and North, Western North Africa. But like so many of the backyard species that we, we feature here, uh, they do well with humans and, and they, they have spread worldwide today. So now the stinging nettle is found worldwide, especially in temperate areas and especially in wet areas. They really like kind of wet, rich soils. Um, so Riverside Park has a good, uh, a good abundance of stinging nettles, um, which is an indicator that it's decent soil there. It's found in every state and Canadian province except Hawaii and um, particularly abundant in the rainforests of the Pacific Northwest. It does reach down into northern Mexico and the wetter temperate areas of South America, Australia, and especially New Zealand. And one of the reasons for its success is that strong association with human habitation, um, particularly areas where, where humans have fertilized land, uh, cropland, old abandoned farm fields. The stinging nettle in particular is particularly important to butterflies like the peacock butterfly, the kama, and the small tortoise shell. It's interesting, the kama is, not, is a native butterfly that has adapted to the stinging nettle. Uh, it's also important to moths like anglishades, underwings, and the ghost moth feeds on its roots. The caterpillar does. The species name is Urtica dioica, dioisa. Urtica, so again, Urtica is for the urticating properties and dioisa comes from the word diocese, dioisi, not the other kind of diocese, uh, which basically means the, the plants are dioecious, which means that the individual plants are either male or female. They produce male or female gametes. So, uh, and 
And then one of the reasons why this plant is so successful other than its uh, association with humans is that it can propagate both sexually and asexually. So asexually through rhizomes, producing clones, or sexually through wind pollination. The flowers of stinging nettle are very fairly inconspicuous, uh, as is often the case when you have green flowers like this. But this is the stinging nettle. So what's going on with the stinging? Uh, the stinging nettle, like many other nettles, has uh, these hollow stinging hairs called, they call, they're called trichomes. Um, they're concentrated on the stem and the leaves, usually the underside of the leaves. They're made of silica and they're filled with toxins. So essentially they act like a kind of fiberglass hypodermic needle. So not only do they poke you like a thorn, which, which hurts in one way, but then they also break off into your skin uh, and inject you know, whatever their, their recipe of chemicals is for the species. It's often histamines, similar to a wasp sting. Um, and, uh, but again, they tend to be a little bit less, less intense, uh, at least our local one does. Um, and, but, but it's, that, it's those chemicals after you're, you're poked and after the, the, sp the spine comes off into your body and the chemicals are released. And that's what causes that stinging sensation. And different people react differently to the sting. Um, so I know a lot of people that have on purpose or accidentally been exposed to nettle. And, and for some, uh, it's just, you barely even notice it. Um, but for others, you have a, a, a decent reaction and, and it can hurt a little more. Um, you can see varying degrees of local inflammation on your skin. So like a bunch of little mosquito bites, um, and if and if it is bad, if you do react badly, you can apply any kind of anti-itch drug that has antihistamines or, or hydrocortisone. But uh, I think our stinging nettle shows some mercy because mercy, um, because no matter how badly you react, it usually goes away pretty quickly, either either a matter of a few minutes or maybe up to twenty minutes. So um, it's it's usually not a terrible encounter. Usually no worse for the wear. Um, and, and kind of another cool fact about the nettle is that it, no matter where it grows, it tends to uh, be near other plants that are natural soothing remedies. So in Europe, nettles tend to grow near a, a plant called the broadleaf dock that likes the similar kind of rich, wet environments as nettles. So if you get stung by the nettle, the, the, the folk remedy in Europe is that you rub the, the dock leaf um, over the parts where you were stung and it provides you relief. Here in the States, nettle often grows by jewelweed. So if you, if you walk down into the, into the kind of valley at Riverside Park, the path to the river at the bottom of the stairs, you'll see nice, nice pockets of both nettle and jewelweed growing together. Um, the, it, the jewelweed is called the jewelweed because it, uh, it has these tiny hairs on the leaf that provide a, a natural barrier to water. So if it rains, water droplets just kind of run off of it like a, a duck's back or just they bead on the surface um, like, like beads of mercury and they, and they shimmer like a jewel, which is how it got its name, jewelweed. And if you, this is fun, you should try this sometime. If you take a leaf of the jewelweed and just put it under water, um, the, the tiny hairs of the jewelweed trap these air bubbles and then it causes the leaf to shimmer like a jewel. Um, it's also called touch me not because they have the those really fun seed pods that disperse the seeds through a, a mechanical catapult action. So oftentimes you just touch touch the pod with your finger, and it kind of explodes and shoots the seeds everywhere, and then the the old seed pod kind of curls up into the spiral you see on the right. But Jewelweed is also thought to have healing properties similar to aloe vera, and I've been told that if you're stung by nettle, you can find a jewelweed and, and crush the leaf or, or, or the stem uh, to access the healing sap, and then you can rub it on the places that you've been stung for some soothing relief. I can't testify as to whether that works or not. I've never really tried it. Um, it might. I, I've definitely rubbed out this, the jewelweed on my skin, um, but I, uh, you know, part of it is likely that you're just doing something to that sting. So like a, a placebo or something, 
Um, so you're, you're probably, even if it doesn't help, you're probably making yourself feel better. Um, I've also heard that rubbing mud over the sting can help. But either way, um, you know, the, the sting usually isn't that bad. I'm, I'm sure for some it is. But e even if it is, it, it tends to go away very quickly. Uh, there is another species of nettle around here, and this is a native plant. And um, I tend to find this on the, on the west side of the river. It's called wood nettle. And um, to me, this one, through experience, uh, I think packs a bit of a stronger string, sting. Um, so if, you, if, you, if, if I brush up against wood nettle, I react and I, and I pull my hand back immediately like, like I touched a hot stove or something. I don't do that with the, with the stinging nettle. Um, so it's a little more intense, uh, searing, and thankfully, like the nettle, that, that pain and irritation is pretty short lasting. So, um, you know, maybe a, maybe a little longer in the wood nettle. But uh, if you want to compare the two, if you go to, again, the Milwaukee River, the west side of the trail, some, you know, between Locust and Capitol, um, if you really want to compare the two for the full effect, the, 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 if, if you see the folks that sting themselves on YouTube to get subscribers, they will, they will often put the stinger right on the, the bottom of their, you know, between their, your wrist and your elbow, like on the bottom side of your forearm. Um, the skin is really thin there. And so you can feel the full effect of, of whatever stinging you see. Sometimes your, the skin in your fingers is even too thick for the stinging nettle. Um, so if you, it, you know, you could, you could rub wood nettle on one arm and you could rub stinging nettle on the other arm and, and compare and, and get the full, uh, the full, you know, do, do the science. Um, but, or not, I don't know, whatever you decide. And uh, the, the thing that was most surprising to me about this, uh, as we kind of, kind of wrap it up here, um, so I knew that stinging nettle was edible, and as a naturalist, that's something I always say, you know, it's, it's an edible plant. Uh, but what surprised me was, was it's a much bigger culinary force now and through time than I thought. So many, many cultures around the world have been uh, eating nettles in, in, in many different ways um, and using nettles. And, and uh, you know, I just was, was I, I'm kind of aware of it. So, I mean, I guess in my mind, it was like this, it was the, it was the hippie naturalist foragers that, that, that used it. And um, uh, it, it isn't quite as mainstream as, you know, a lot of other plants, but uh, I was surprised to see the following that nettles have, uh, like Vivian's friend who who grows it in her front yard. So, um, you know, it's 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 been used for a long time. There's a lot of resources out there. There's cookbooks. There's websites. There's podcasts uh, that are focused on raising nettle for gardening. Um, it, you know, it has some other benefits that we'll talk about, but then primarily for eating and. You know, I think to start with, it's important to know that cooking or drying or even soaking the nettle uh, denatures that stinging part quickly. So it really does not take much to to render that stinging harmless. So you don't have to worry about a a, a mouthful of interesting feelings. Um, so a, a very common way to use nettle is is similar to like how you use spinach as a cooked green. Um, so steaming it or sauteing it. Another easy way to prepare it is to dry it. And once it dries, again, the stinger goes away. You can just hang it up um, and let it dry. And then once it's dry, you, it's often used as a spice, uh, as, as an herb, um, steeped as a tea. Uh, they're nettles in general, they're, they're pureed, they're cooked. They're, as a food source, they're very high in, in vitamins and, and minerals, particularly iron. Um, so super healthy, uh, and and one important thing to know is that the timing of the of harvesting the leaves is important too. So those in the know, uh, there's usually usually they they you know from what I understand they they pick out the younger leaves, the younger shoots, um, because as they age uh, in 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 the leaf, they'll accumulate these these things called cystoliths, which are, are calcium carbonate and um, that can irritate the kidneys. But on the flip side, nettle is also considered a diuretic, which then can help prevent things like kidney stones, because uh, the stones don't have as much time to, to form if they're consistent, consistently washed. 
um, or, or even UTIs, uh, bacteria, it's harder for them to accumulate if you have a diuretic uh, kind of constantly flushing the system. Um, but even for the older leaves, you can remove those cystoliths uh, through the fermentation process. So uh, stinging nettles are also used to make alcohol. Um, they're even used in, in some parts of the world in, in cheese making process. Uh, I should say, please don't use anything I say today as medical advice. I'm not a practitioner. Uh, and so if you are interested in the medical benefits of nettle, um, please consult your trusted healthcare provider and not me. I was also surprised to learn about the practical uses of nettle as a fiber, as a, as a material. Um, so it, it can be woven into yarn and into other materials. Um, it can be grown, it's a little coarser than, than cotton, but it can be grown without pesticides. Um, and cultures around the world have been using it for thousands of years um, as a textile for many different purposes, for clothing, for netting. Um, and it produces a, a natural kind of yellowish greenish dye. Um, so, so many uses. And another benefit of having nettles around is that something that gardeners have known for a long time is that they tend to support a stronger plant community around them. Um, they kind of act as a natural fertilizer in the soil. They tend to protect plants around them um, from, from insect infestation. They, they also encourage beneficial insects to visit, and they're, they're an indicator of fertile soil since they naturally grow in high quality areas. Uh, stinging nettle is also the primarily, primary host plant for the caterpillar of the beautiful native red admiral butterfly. And um, stinging nettle has important and promising applications in treating ailments like arthritis and tendonitis. So you can either get over-the-counter treatments or homeopathic treatments, but I found out that a lot of people just will go out and if they have sore areas, they'll just rub the nettle over the, the areas that are you know, giving them issues kind of trading out a few minutes of discomfort, but then once the swelling goes down, they, they report that they feel better. So it's a longer period of relief, um, particularly from arthritis after the irritation and swelling goes down. And then for all you linguists out there, um, nettle appears a lot in, in literature and in folklore uh, and in common phrases. So Aesop uh, has an interesting, he, he wrote, Gently touch a nettle and it'll sting you for your pains, but grasp it as a lad of metal and soft as soft as silk remains, which refers to the fact that nettle is actually a little more irritating if you touch it softly, um, because then those, those hairs can really enter your skin. If you grasp it har harshly, hard, uh, firmly, then a lot of times those hairs are crushed before they can get into your skin and and, and put the poison in. Um, Shakespeare wrote, out of this nettle danger, we pluck this flower safety, safe flower comma safety. Uh, in German, there's a phrase that essentially says, if you're sitting in nettles, that means you're getting into trouble. Um, and there's a Hungarian saying that alludes to the fact that the devil won't hurt you if you're in nettles because the devil looks after his own, uh, kind of giving nettles a, a bad name. And then my favorite in French, uh, there's a, a fairly pensive saying, which basically translates as, uh, don't push your grandma into the stinging nettles. So that's the, the stinging nettle. And my relationship with nettles has been both traumatic and healthy. And I've, I've learned to respect their power to urticate. I still get stung by nettles all the time in Milwaukee's green spaces. and. And as Maggie knows, to me, it's, it's more of a, a, a tingling sensation than an irritation. In fact, I kind of like it. Um, I still don't like the wood nettle, but uh, I encourage you to explore your relationship with nettle, either by learning to recognize it and respect it, um, or taking the next step and learning to garden with it and eat it. Um, but remember, whatever you do, however you feel about nettles, please don't push your grandma into them. So... Thanks for joining us today. We will see you next time. I will stop sharing my screen.